Hey folks, Seth Liebson here. As we watch cities burn, statues being torn down, and calls to defund the police, if you haven't already, it may be time to think about personal protection. Guns Etc. has 10,200 square feet of guns, ammo, safes, and a staff that will work with you to find the best firearm for your situation. So stop by their huge store in Mesa or click on GunsEtc.com and have access to over $400 million in firearms and accessories. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriot's YouTube channel. Happy July 28th, 2020. Yesterday, I closed the show with a quote from Professor Irving Kristol in 1970. I thought it prescient, if not perfectly appropriate, for today. He wrote, quote, When we lack the will to see things as they really are, there's nothing quite so mystifying as the obvious. This is the case, I think, with the new upsurge of radicalism that is now shaking much of Western society to its foundations. We have constructed the most ingenious sociological and psychological theories, as well as a few disingenuously naive ones to explain this phenomenon. But there is, in truth, no mystery here. Our youthful rebels are anything but inarticulate, and though they utter a great deal of nonsense, the import of what they are saying is clear enough. What they are saying is that they dislike, to put it mildly, the liberal, individualistic, capitalist civilization that stands ready to receive them as citizens. They are rejecting this offer of citizenship and are declaring their desire to see some other kind of civilization replace it. That most of them do not always put the matter as explicitly or as candidly as this is besides the point. Some of them do, of course, and we try to dismiss them as the lunatic fringe. But the mass of dissident young are not, after all, sufficiently educated to understand the implications of everything they say. Besides, it is so much easier for the less bold among them to insist that what they find outrageous are the defects and shortcomings of the present system. It is consoling to think that the turmoil among them is provoked by the extent to which our society falls short of realizing its ideals. But the plain truth is that it is these ideals themselves that are being rejected. Our young radicals are far less dismayed at America's failure to become what it ought to be than they are contemptuous of what it thinks it ought to be. For them, it is not the average American who is disgusting. It is the ideal American. He wrote that in 1977, excuse me, in 1970. By 1977, Professor Crystal was writing of the obituary of socialism. There he wrote this. Today, we live in a world with, with an ever-increasing number of people who call themselves socialists, an ever-increasing number of political regimes that call themselves socialists. But where the socialist ideal itself has been voided of all meaning and frequently of all humane substance as well. True. There is a dwindling ban of socialist fideists who keep insisting that we must not judge socialism by any of its works. The Soviet Union, they tell us, was not socialist at all, nor China, nor Yugoslavia, nor Cuba, nor Hungary, or all those other people's democracies in the 1970s. Neither, of course, are such regimes as exist in Venezuela or Syria, whose claims to socialist legitimacy are not to be taken very seriously. As for Western countries with social democratic governments such as Britain or Sweden, well, they get a passing grade for effort, but it seems that they are insufficiently resolute or intelligent to bring socialism about, at least true socialism. This is all quite ridiculous, of course. Socialism is what socialism does. The plaintive lament of the purist that socialism or capitalism has never really been tried is simply the expression of petulance and obstinacy on the part of ideologues who, convinced that they have a more profound understanding than anyone else in the world and in its history, now find that they have been living a huge self-deception. People who persist in calling themselves socialists while decrying the three-quarters of the world that has proclaimed itself socialist and who can find a socialist country nowhere but in their imaginings, such people are anachronisms. As such, they do serve a purpose. They help the historian and scholar understand what socialists used to think socialism was all about. One could discover that from reading books, to be sure, but it is sometimes enlightening to interview an actual survivor. The absolute contradiction between the socialist reality today and the original socialist ideal is most perfectly revealed by the utter refusal of socialist collectives even to think seriously about that ideal. Perhaps the most extraordinary fact 
of the 20th century's intellectual history is that all thinking about socialism only takes place in non-socialist countries, close quote. Now think about this for a moment. The critique of socialist countries takes place only in non-socialist countries. The critique of Marxist-run countries only takes place or took place in non-Marxist countries. In tyrannies, as in autocracies, the nature, much less the ethic, much less the toleration or permission of introspection or self-critique or self-renewal, is absent because it's forbidden, illegal because it's outlawed. This is what makes survival in tyranny so hard. You comply or you are imprisoned or killed. You see a soul's in Itzen and he's imprisoned. You hear and read what he has to say only because it's published in and he travels to America. Dissidents in, in China today, imprisoned or killed. Same with Cuba, same with Venezuela, same with socialist and theocratic run regimes throughout the Middle East. This is why you often hear me quote Supreme Court Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, writing, those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. Which brings us to now and today. We did not defeat Marxism in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. We thought we had. We had not. We ignored China, Cuba, revolutionaries elsewhere, and we ignored what was rising at the precisely same time here in America, a phenomenon known as political correctness, which was then in its infancy. It meant that, in short, if you did not tout the conventional wisdom of the progressive intellectual, you were politically incorrect. And the conventional wisdom of the progressive intellectual became a never-ending cascade of propositions and beliefs. They may have started with the import of requiring adherence to something like race-based affirmative action programs and policies, whereby saying that judging people based on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin was politically incorrect. But it has now moved fast forward to today where Refusal to adopt the language of a literally self-admitted race-based Marxist movement like Black Lives Matter is not only politically incorrect, but the cause for shaming and firing, being it in a, be it in a university, a school, or a corporation. Statements of sheer fact and labeling about an infection's origins can be the cause for shaming, discipline, and firing. Exercising your own opinion about others' own opinions about the greatness or vileness of this country can also be the cause for not only shaming, but discipline and firing. Catherine Kerstin put it this way, quote, Today, a Puritan-inspired witch hunt mentality is ablaze all around us, bent on destroying the reputations and livelihoods of those who show the slightest hesitation to profess true doctrine. Forced conversions to the new faith are also becoming commonplace. What explains this lightning speed capitulation? For many young people, conversion to the woke faith can be part of a search for meaning in our post-Christian society, close quote. Yes, I think she's right, and belief in a strong, even revolutionary political doctrine has always been a challenge in an open society, especially where the strength and greatness of other beliefs are weakened, challenged, vitiated, and condemned. So note the, tra note the trick, weaken, challenge and condemn the American cause, and you have opened wide the door to allow other doctrines into the intellectual slipstream that soon enough and more, more and more will become part of the intellectual mainstream. Then the trick needs a second move. Make it unpopular, shameful, and subject to ridicule to stand by or support something like the American cause. Then the third part of the trick. Call it an intellectual hat trick, if you will. You have to forbid exactly that kind of defense of your culture or your country or your history. America, via shame, cancellation, and even, yes, punishment. And then you end up where we are, an exact importation of all we worked to defeat and thought, but we were wrong, was defeated in 1989. Professor Harry Jaffa put it this way, diversity is demanded by those who will tolerate no deviation from the politically correct. And what is political correctness but, but another name for the party line? It's Leninism, Stalinism without Lenin or Stalin. Racism is the generic term for any kind of false or 
bourgeois consciousness, that is to say, for any opinions not considered politically correct, has nothing to do with what once was called racial prejudice, an unreasonable depreciation of other human beings because of their race, color, or ethnic origin. The charge of racism is made by the very people demanding racial quotas, race norming, and segregated racial and ethnic centers. To point out the, con the contradiction in these demands, or indeed of any demands made by the politically correct, is to bring on the accusations of further racism, or logism, which means the use of reason, a vice-held characteristic of Eurocentrism. There's always an ism. The contempt for Eurocentrism as an endemic vice corresponds closely to Marx's contempt for false consciousness engendered in the ruling classes of all societies founded upon private property. Racism itself is then nothing but the endemic quality of human consciousness prior to the transformation of human egotism into human altruism. Political correctness is nothing less than the blind and willful insistence upon the fulfillment of the goals of revolutionary Marxist Leninism without any reference to those failed enterprises themselves or to any rational political anal analysis. Indeed, the new political correctness differs from its predecessor only in its insistence that no reason needs to be given as to why it is correct. It is a synthesis of the goals of Marxism with the philosophical horizon of nihilism. And so we end up where we began with what Irving Kristol wrote. A contempt for America in both its workaday values as well as its ideal values. They start with political preferences, but they end with a contempt not just for their fellow Americans' preferences, but animus against the system known as America itself. Shame on us for letting it happen, and shame on them for being so illiberal and undemocratic that they think they are right. One shame has to end, and soon or we'll all be doomed.